Welcome to this overview of the VentureLogic project development methodology. This is uh, Lori Elliott with Afrobiz, and uh, we're putting this together to give uh, people who are working with us or uh, those that are participating in our programs a better understanding of how our uh, VentureLogic project development methodology uh, flows together. Um, because obviously there's a lot of detail that's involved in uh, developing a project and so there are a lot of elements and sometimes people can get lost in, in all the pieces. So uh, first I want to say that um, the VentureLogic project development methodology, it's a comprehensive framework that comes along with tools and resources to strengthen project developers capacity to develop and structure bankable projects in Africa. Now, uh, what can those projects be? This methodology, to a great extent, can uh, obviously be applied to many different scenarios which involve uh, sites. Uh, could be agriculture, could be anything that you know requires some type of environmental analysis, social impact. Uh, but really, we're focusing uh, to a greater degree in our programs on uh, long-term projects, things like energy, infrastructure, uh, which are more focused on project finance. So you will find this information highly useful in either regard, but uh, you may or your project may be more suited to our venture development track, uh, which really works in tandem with project development. Um, in fact, our project development methodology is an offshoot of our venture development. But because of the types of projects that require uh, even more comprehensive uh, review and development, uh, we have uh, done this spinoff for specifically for projects of a certain nature. So basically things that are in infrastructure, um, uh, public sector services, uh, energy, uh, major industrial like processing, um, you know, mining, refineries, anything that has a long term, would have a long term finance uh, upwards of 20 or so years. Agriculture, typically you're not going to see that because it's based on you, your your flow or your capacity or your potential revenue, uh, you know, goes up and down depending from year to year. So that's just, you know, one example. So things like uh, airport, rail, road, oil and gas projects, pipelines, um, even stadiums, sports stadiums, uh, health and education services, uh, things that are often contracted uh, with government, public-private partnerships, and including uh, things like, um, you know, independent power producers where you're selling energy in uh, one case to the government, but you are actually developing it, but then you're getting a power purchase agreement. So that's just a very big generalization just to give you an idea, uh, but you should consult with us uh, where we see that your project fits. It certainly doesn't hurt you to take both venture development and project development because you'll find that uh, venture development actually goes into more detail on some areas about pulling your project together or developing a venture uh, that we cannot cover in project development. Uh, in project development, we're looking towards that cycle of those long-term project finance oriented uh, types of projects. So um, this methodology then, when we're focusing on these types of projects, it actually frames a project in three ways. One is with process. Um, you know, how do you carry it from idea all the way through implementation? Although our focus is from idea up until construction. Then, um, I'm sorry, with the goal of ensuring that you have the opportunity to present your project, you know, for finance. So really a, a big reason for all of this is to help project developers and others um, who are key stakeholders get the projects to a point where they're bankable and they're, they are then presentable to funders. Um, and you'll see that there are just, you know, many different components to do that. So that's part of that process. Um, then we do content and context looking in detail at different variables that impact how well a project can be brought together. And these are really things that, um, you know, very often, uh, you know, project developers cannot necessarily control. It could be, you know, government regulations, it could be the environment of technology, you know, what stage, um, 
you know, is that sector, what type of technology is out there. And so the content is really where, and the context is really where the project either lives or dies. But the things that we do with process and the things that we do with the third piece, the stakeholder ecosystem, helps us to better manage the content and context so that we can shape and structure bankable projects. Okay, so uh, we have to recognize that projects need to be viewed through more than one lens and that's what our methodology allows you to do. Just doesn't look at process, there's a lot of content elements and another key thing is how well your stakeholder ecosystem is working with you. And so the intersection of these three views then provide a richer, more robust way to investigate, develop, or prepare, and structure projects in Africa. So while a systematic, comprehensive methodology cannot guarantee a bankable project, remember, it's still often very much focused on the content and context. Uh, it does ensure a path that can get you there if the project has the potential to be bankable. Um, and so with that then, you know, once you're able to then shape develop and then structure your project, you then have those opportunities that you need for them to be funded and to bring in other resources and partners. You know, many of you may still not really quite realize, but uh, basically in the landscape of uh, investment and funding, the vast majority, over 90, 95% of uh, investors and funders want to come in when the project is bankable. And so you have to make it bankable. That means that you have a lot of upfront costs, a lot of upfront time. So, um, and there are those who may do feasibility, but it's often not, you know, that's not something that uh, investors will necessarily come into if they don't know you. So relationships, stakeholders, having uh, previous successes, all of these things, just like in general business, are very important. So, uh, so while um, you know you may have a great project or have a great potential project, you still have to understand that there's a lot of work that has to be done to make it bankable. And so, I think this is where we're trying to you know fill in the gap to help um, people understand that. And then also through our other mechanisms, um, you know, we can look at funding some projects, and others can look at funding projects you know, at the feasibility stage, um, which is not a common uh, occurrence. That's, so I want you to be clear that the vast majority when you're going after funding, where they want to come in is after you've done the feasibility and you've proved that the project is bankable. Um, and that it even includes uh, EPCs. If you're doing an energy project or other similar projects where you need an engineering procurement and contractor, oftentimes they want something uh, feasibility. They want to see that it's a good chance. They are not willing to take the risk. And so what this will help you do is manage more of that upfront to get you where you need to go so you can begin to bring in the funding resources and partners. And uh, I just want to encourage you not to get lost in a lot of the detail right now, um, particularly when you start out, you know, if you're working on a project and then you're, you're from this, you're going into uh, looking at uh, one of our programs, don't get lost in the detail. There's you know, plenty of detail, there's plenty of variables, many things that you have to look at, I mean hundreds of things. But the point is, is that you have to stay above that in order to manage the process. Uh, you will have to work with detail, but you don't want to be overcome by it. So, you know, keep in mind again, you know, what we're providing is a path so that you can get your project, if it has the potential to be bankable, you have a process and a path, resources and tools and a framework to help you get to that point. Uh, but there are many other variables, including the actual feasibility, social, economic, technical, and environmental uh, assessments to show if they are actually those elements are feasible. Uh, availability of funds. Now, to a great degree, there are availability of funds uh, at the end of that cycle, not for the project development cycle, or I should say, not the, um, you know, you know, before you've proven that the project is feasible. And so there's very limited funds, and that is just a, a natural, uh, you know, dynamic. So um, you will have to anticipate that you will have to uh, pull together resources with friends, family, colleagues, you know, even collateralizing some things, you know, to get loans in order to get through this process. Um, that is a typical scenario. It is not typical for you to find a funder when you just have a few elements flushed out. They, 
I, again, and I, I keep repeating this, uh, they want to see a bankable project. And so you as the project developer or the project sponsor are taking that responsibility to do all of that. And, you know, again, I'm not saying that there aren't other scenarios. There are. But the vast majority of people who do come in early, they're few and far between. Okay, so what we're trying to do is help you get steam in your project when you don't necessarily have access to that. And the further along you develop your project and the better it takes shape, the more likely you are to be able to bring in resources and partners, if not immediately funding. But if you take the venture development, you will be able to see more of how you can raise capital for those early stages. Um, and it's not a one size fits all. It's a very dynamic process. But uh, that is, uh, you know, it is possible to get what you need. But you have to first understand these pieces before you can do that. Okay, so, you know, when we talk so about availability of funds, even when funds are available, well, funders and investors will have different priorities and requirements. So you need to really understand that if you are going to a funder, and you know, this is an obvious thing, that only does agriculture, but you have, um, you know, you have an oil project, well, it's not likely, unless you can prove that it somehow fits into the oil sector, that uh, they're going to fund you. Okay, so it's important to understand who the funders are and the investors. Uh, also, critical agreements, you know, in these projects, you need to have your EPC locked down, you need to have your um, uh, designs, you need to have your um, uh, agreements, um, you know, like a power purchase agreement done. And so all of these things are, are very important. And they basically will ultimately determine if your project is actually bankable and therefore if it gets funded. So it's not, the process does not, again, uh, guarantee that you have a bankable project or that you will get funding. But it is giving you all the tools that you need to help you get there um, to understand and to manage that process so you have a much higher likelihood of doing so. Okay? So let's just uh, take a look at the image. I just want to explain the, the image before I get into the detail. So basically um, at the top you'll see that we have the three circles. To the left you'll see ideas. So that means that you generally start with an idea you know, of a project that you would like to do. Maybe someone's presented you an opportunity. Maybe you have a good relationship with a, a government department and they actually want you to want to see if you can do something with the project. So, um, so it starts with idea and then you'll see at the end, you'll see the word construction. So this is again just framing the idea that where we're talking about project development, we're talking about from idea to the start of construction. And really um, to the, um, you know, finalization of financial close. Really, that's what we're saying. Uh, we don't get so much into to the rest of that. And uh, then you'll notice that underneath the three circles there are uh, diamonds, and those are decision diamonds. That's basically saying, am I going to do go forward to the next stage? And so you know you'll see that there's there's four there for each stage. But even when you have an idea, you have to assess, and that's part of you know the programs and the workshop is really for you to determine, you know, am I really ready to do this and invest this time and effort? Because it is not a short process. It is uh, requires a lot of work. Uh, to even get past the concept, this first circle, the concept development stage. And so you have to put forth the effort or the resources or the money uh, in order to do that. So these are, you should be asking yourselves these questions as you go along. You know, do I feel that, you know, this is something that I want to continue pursuing? And uh, then below the decision is, um, that's our content and contextual factors area, which talks about all the different uh, areas that you would look at on your project over this project development life cycle. Okay, and then at the bottom, comprehension is just simply meaning that all of those uh, elements all together, um, you know, they have to come together in a single business model that makes sense and that's viable. First, economically viable, then socially, technically, environmentally. Okay, and so those are the, the, that's the high level of what we're looking at. So let's go back up again to the top and I will talk about uh, the process. So basically there are uh, three major um, 
we can call them phases, you can call them stages. Um, there's concept development, which is really just taking that idea and getting down a solid concept, a solid business model of what this could look like. You're not actually proving it out, you're investigating, and you're just developing baselines to even determine if this project makes sense to go forward. Then in proof of concept, that's where you're fleshing things out. Uh, you're trying to see if this is going to be bankable. And so uh, you do many different things in order to do that. And then in concept finalization, in our model, it's really concept refinement and co finalization. So it's actually two pieces. But here, just to make it simple, we just put it into to one category. And so with that, you are then, um, you know, basically have proven that it is a, a potential project, that it is, you know, uh, feasible and uh, bankable. And so now you are doing things to finalize it so that it's prepared uh, for finance. And uh, so now let's go back and take a closer look at um, each of the phases. Now note also that they're in circles and that they're arrows at the top and the bottom of the circle. That means that every single one of these stages is iterative. You literally keep working it until, for example, in concept development, you come up with a good concept document. Um, it's not just, you know, a kind of, you know, gate that you just, you do this one thing and then you go to the next and then you go to the next. You keep building within that phase or that stage until you get um, you know, as much as you can and as strong as you can in terms of a concept document with this first stage. So what does that mean? Um, that basically means that you are investigating and doing background research for the most part to understand what's going on, understand the challenges, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats that um, are likely to, to take place on this project. In fact, you can do a SWOT analysis at each stage to just give you a very high level view of what you're dealing with. Okay, what is the strength of our project? What is the weakness? What are the opportunities? And what are the threats? So that can serve as just a really high level quick look at, um, you know, what you need to do. So when we talk about uh, baselines, we then have um, all these different activities and or analyses or documents that you're putting together. First is the project definition. Now this is um, basically how you start. You have an idea, but you need to collect some basic uh, information on the project. That includes um, what are the some of the environmental factors, financial policy, um, you know, where will it be located, where is the potential site, and again, you may not know this, but you have to put some, down some general ideas. Until you have that written, okay, um, you should not really be trying to go to people to talk to them about your project in any formal way. You can certainly say, I have this project, I have this idea in mind, can you tell me a little bit how I should go forward with it? But um, the first document that you have that you use to communicate that you have some understanding of what you're you know, headed into is your project definition document. And that, again, is defining what the project is. So people want to know, you know, is it going to be, what, do you think it's going to be 10, 20 megawatts? You know, just to give an idea, okay? And, of course, nothing is proven at this stage. So, again, people don't necessarily take you serious institutions because there's a lot of work ahead. Uh, then the contextual analysis really talks about all the different factors of the context in which the project is going to operate. That includes government, social, um, business, um, geographic, and so this is also known as an environmental analysis from a business perspective. Uh, we changed the name because we actually have added some other dimensions, but also uh, because it can get confusing when you say environmental analysis and then there's an environmental impact assessment that's done on you know, the specific land on the specific site. So it's just a little bit easier to keep the language straight. Um, then also we have the stakeholder potential partner analysis and basically, um, again, the stakeholder ecosystem that you develop is uh, very important. Stakeholders are those who either uh, have control of, influence, or will benefit from or contribute to your project. So again, this could be the EPC, it could be government, it could be your customers, it could be um, 
you know, your vendors. Uh, so really it's everyone that has a piece somehow in this project in a major way. So we're really talking about key stakeholders. And when you go through our programs, our workshops, and incubation, um, all of that will become readily apparent of what are the typical stakeholders and who and how do you need to interface with them. But basically you need to assess that and determine who those people are, those institutions. The reason for that is not just to know who's going to have a stake in it, but oftentimes these stakeholders, if you view the project not just from, let's say, a government and, let's say, a customer perspective, but you look at all the pl key players, you'll actually often find resources, whether it's IP, whether it's endorsement, whether it's early funding, and things like that through the stakeholder ecosystem. So understanding what's there and developing that becomes very important. So in concept development, you spend time as you're researching other things about your uh, potential project, uh, you do the same with your stakeholders. And then stage one, stakeholder engagement, what does that mean? Um, when you're doing projects, many of you already know that you need to do a social impact assessment, which typically means looking at who is impacted by that site when you decide to build and do something on it. And so that's often communities, you know, in the surrounding area. And there may be other stakeholders, but often when they talk about that, they're talking about, um, you know, community. And so um, that, that whole process of social impact assessment is really a part of stakeholder engagement, which is the overall uh, facilitation management um, of the key stakeholders for the project. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in what we do is we differentiate between a transaction and a project. Uh, we see a project as a ecosystem of relationships where value is exchanged. Okay, so obviously if you have the customer, the end customer, if it's energy, they're receiving energy. If it's the government, they're receiving capacity to deliver that energy. And so they're obviously key stakeholders. But the government, um, but you may never actually in that case, for example, um, you know, interface with the end user. Okay, because you're then connected to the grid in an energy project, and then it's the government that delivers that service. Okay, so um, so stage one engagement is really just talking about uh, getting to know who the people and institutions are. Uh, you might have informal conversations with them about the project to understand uh, what exists, what challenges, what opportunities, uh, who to go to. And you, as you do that initial engagement and how you engage with them, can also um, indicate or um, motivate them to support you in what you're doing. Not in written form, not informal at this point because it's very early. Many of these stakeholders will be looking for you to show that you are moving forward. And as you demonstrate that you're moving your project forward, they then come on board and provide support, um, you know, in a larger way. Typically getting information, you know, that type of thing, it's, it's relatively easy. So stage one stakeholder engagement, even when you're just trying to identify potential partners or the stakeholders, you want to be strategic and think, okay, when I'm looking at all these stakeholders or potential stakeholders, uh, who do I really need to have on my side to get this project done? And that's really part of the stage one stakeholder engagement. You know, engaging with those people that will be very instrumental in getting you from this stage all the way through, and that includes even the implementation of the project. And so um, we won't go into detail here, but you'll see as we, you know, talk in the programs how that's structured. Then we look at uh, network cluster ecosystem analysis, and um, basically let me also just mention also the value chain industrial cluster analysis. They're very similar. Basically what you're doing is you're looking at different systems, okay, a network is organized different than a cluster and then an ecosystem and a value chain or an industrial cluster. But, and they have a different view, just like we have the three different views for our methodology, process, content, and context, a stakeholder ecosystem, which gives you, you know, a three-dimension view of your project by looking at these different uh, views of, uh, people and institutions, you know, or, uh, or things around a project, 
um, or the environment around a project, you g yield and understand different information. So when, for example, you see a network, you just see a network of people and institutions connected together in a particular way because of relationships, could be uh, because of things that they provide each other. But a value chain is pretty straightforward. You know, it's very process oriented. It's you know starts with inputs and then goes to the to the end product. You know, being delivered to the customer. But each view again gives you a different type of information. And as you overlay them, you begin to understand things about your uh, the environment around your project or the uh, ecosystem what the existing ecosystem looks like. And so much of these baselines are not about developing as of yet, it's about discovering and exploring what's there. Not saying that you'll use them in the way that they're fashioned, because the idea of um, you know, creating something that's bankable is to be able to take uh, what exists and what doesn't exist and create something out of maybe a combination of what exists and doesn't, reconfiguring or doing something entirely new. Now when we're talking about projects, you know, like energy, whatever, we're really not talking about totally new things because, um, you know, funders basically want stuff that's proven. They want, you know, commercially viable technology. They want certainty. They want minimization of risk. And remember that the whole thing about project development is to maximize the value and minimize the risk. That's the overarching theme that you're trying to do so that you can get resources, partners, and funders and investors to come on board with you. Okay, so uh, some of these other things, competitor industry analysis, customer markets analysis, I think those are pretty obvious. Those are things that are typically done. Um, of course, you know, when people think of projects, government projects, they don't necessarily look at a competitor industry analysis in the same way because often those projects are tendered or they might be sole sourced. So, but you still need to understand elements of what that industry looks like in that particular country and uh, also what the customer and markets look like. Okay, and then of course distribution channels, how when you develop the site, for example, if it's energy or if it's roads, uh, how are people going to get access to your services? So if it's a road, for example, there's really not much of a distribution channel, right? The road opens, people go down the tollway, so you don't necessarily have to, you know, it's not a detailed thing, but also you just always want to think about the elements that are important to a business model and just investigate. So once you've gotten the baseline, and that's again just investigating, reviewing, seeing what's there, understanding what's going on, um, and then knowing where you're trying to head, you can then put together an idea, a concept, not an idea, but actually flesh out the idea of what um, the project might actually look like, who might be the players, um, you know, um, what are the key elements that you believe you need to pull together, and then that's your concept document. Once you have the concept document, you can then, you know, have more what I would call, um, you know, formal engagements with um, um, discussions with potential stakeholders or anyone that you feel is necessary to move the project forward because you have something in writing and they can see that you actually did quite a bit of work. Now the thing with this is that in our uh, methodology, we have set it up so that you can really do the vast majority of the concept development by yourself, you know, or on your internal team without necessarily having to hire external people. However, um, this is a uh, data intensive, um, act, you know, set of activities. Um, and so often this is why consultants, you know, end up doing this because it's a lot of data collection, gathering, analysis, compiling, and then writing up a report, okay? And so a concept document is not a report, but it is an output, so it's a written output. And so some people are not as strong at those types of activities, so they often then choose to have someone do that for them. And that's totally fine as well. Um, what I would suggest is, um, you know, again, finding someone uh, who is on your team who, even if they don't know 100% how to do all of this, because we do in our programs really help you to do that, um, that they are good writers, that they are good with detail, uh, they're able to, you know, in general, they're able to analyze and pull things apart and, you know, write and put things back together. So, so you don't necessarily, 
um, you know, need at this point a consultant uh, to do the baseline. Now, what will happen is as you're going through this concept development stage, you will certainly be coming uh, into uh, technical information, you will be coming into contact with real experts, and so obviously if you're not an, an expert yourself, you know, it, you know, it does, it is good to have someone that can still advise you and give you more detailed understanding and work along with you. It's totally up to you, of course, if you give them the full responsibility of doing that, but in general, you're going to have to pay for that. So that's consulting hours or a retainer fee or something like that. So basically what we're trying to do, again, is help you understand what needs to be done if you have the capacity or can build that internal capacity or find someone to partner with you, you know, to begin to work on these things, then of course you can, um, you know, then cut the cost of what it takes when you first start out. But it does not, our methodology does not uh, eliminate the need for professionals, consultants, technical experts, and all of that. But what it does do is create a more cost-effective and more, um, managed uh, program so that you're assuring that whatever money that you're using, you're using and leveraging it, you know, to a much greater degree than I've normally seen on projects, okay? So it, it really, because there's the methodology and it's detailed, it allows you to do this in a very efficient way. Um, and when I say efficient, that doesn't mean that it's totally efficient, but it's e efficient in terms of how projects are developed. Okay, um, the issues of dealing with content and context often means that sometimes you have to go back to the drawing board and so you have to put more money into something and do something not because you didn't do what you were supposed, uh, you didn't do what you were supposed to do or you didn't manage it correctly but because something just didn't work, you know, an agreement couldn't be reached with, you know, a certain uh, group that you thought you'd be able to. The land after you actually, you know, did a further assessment, it's not appropriate. So again, there are just many different variables but the key is, is that what you're being um, brought into with um, the VentureLogic um, PDM is that you're able to manage this more efficiently and move your project and accelerate it because there's not wasted effort because you just didn't know or you don't have the right resources and stuff like that. Um, and so that's really key for us is, you know, first closing that gap. If that gap can be closed in your project, then you can move it along better. And then it also creates an environment where people are more willing to work along with you because they see that you really do have your pieces together and you know what you're talking about and you know what's missing. You know, you know what you need, you know what's missing, you're very clear, you're very specific, and so when you ask someone to help you with a resource, for example, you say, you know, um, instead of saying, well, you know, I just, I, I want to pull this project together and I want you to help me, okay? That's kind of, you know, that's a huge task when we're talking about a project, okay, or project development, but when you can say, listen, you know, I've pull together, I've done my uh, contextual analysis and I've identified, you know, I feel the majority of stakeholders, what I'd like you to do is just review it for me, you know, see if I'm missing anything, okay? That's a whole different story, okay? And so often you'll find that people will help you, even experts, um, if you've already done your background work, you know? And it's not that you can't consult with them at the beginning and say, okay, um, I, I really need to figure out these stakeholders in, um, you know, the, the, uh, this ecosystem or in, in, uh, in this space, in this industry. Can you give me, you know, a start? Where, what are the top three? What are the top four? Who do you think I should, you know, really identify and know that I need to work with? Okay, so you can, it's not that you have to have a complete story, but you want to, when you go to people, when you go to institutions, you want to be specific. You don't just want to say, I just need help. I need funding. This is what we get a lot of. This is what a lot of people get a lot of. I, I want funding for feasibility. And I can tell you, 95, probably even more, 99% of the people that I talk to, they're not ready. Okay, not at all. Their projects have huge holes in them in terms of prior work, pre-feasibility work um, that they should have done or could have done. And when you complete those things in a more complete way, in a complete fashion, it then creates buy-in for what you're doing. And so people need to trust that you're going to be able to carry this forward. 
um, you know, people are not just throwing money out for feasibility. They're not even throwing money out for projects. They want those projects to be tight, okay? So this is what we're trying to help you do is to do those things so that when you go and speak to people about getting funding, whether it's feasibility, even pre-feasibility, that you really have done a significant amount of work productive work, good work that produces good outputs, not just stuff, um, so that they can see that, you know, you're, what you're doing is, you know, the, uh, that potentially they can buy into it. Okay. So that's really at the concept document level, and at that point, then you obviously begin to talk more to people about what you want to do uh, and how this project is going to work, and basically that concept document is, you know, in a sense gives you kind of a road map because you can kind of see where you're missing and what you don't have, okay, and what you need to tighten up. And so, again, the goal, the first goal in getting your idea out the door is to be able to get through the feasibility study. But you need to build, do some building blocks before you can ask for feasibility money. Uh, Pre-feasibility money, for example, a, co a good concept document, along with a few other things, can actually release then pre-feasibility money to you um, because, again, you have done quite a bit of work on your own in the background to, you know, to flush out, to uh, understand what it takes to do that project. So at that point at the concept document, depending on where you're at, you know, with the project, you may say, okay, we need to hold off or yes, I feel like we can go forward with this. We have the resources to carry it to the next step. And so that next step is proof of concept. That's uh, flushing it out. And um, so as a part of this, again, your end goal is to get to a feasibility, a completed feasibility study. And so um, then you, one of the, prime things that should be seen is, if at all possible, uh, identifying one or a couple sites and doing an initial site assessment. And um, that, you know, may be uh, geographic variables, different things, and of course the program we explain a lot of this. But again, um, your project is actually not a project until there's a site. Okay, and so without a specific site, you know, um, it may be difficult, again, to, to convince people to be a part of or provide funding or resources to the project. So having a potential site that has been not, you know, um, comprehensively assessed, but an initial site assessment, and again, in the programs, you know, we give you an outline of what that looks like, um, that helps quite a bit. Um, also, as a part of the pre-feasibility study, or pr uh, prior to it really, is doing an internal project info uh, memorandum. And so for us, what does that mean? Um, for some, it's, you know, it's just, you know, highlighting where the project is and whatever and, you know, doing presentations to that. But for us, it's actually a detailed exercise. And in order to prepare that, you actually go through, at the bottom, the content and contextual factors. and you. Uh, investigate and analyze where appropriate every single one of those so you have uh, a good understanding of the variables that are impacting your project. You haven't shaped it yet, you haven't structured it, but you do understand the environment, you understand the variables, you know what's going on with your project and then you're able to track it. Okay. When you have that level of understanding, you communicate very differently to people because you understand. Um, you know, I can, you know, we often get people, they will give us, we'll tell them to give us a project brief, then we will show them, for example, just our concept document outline, and they'll tell us, they don't come back to us, the majority, because they're not anywhere ready, okay? And so what we're trying to do is help you uh, communicate not only with us, this, even though this is our methodology, honestly, it is going to help you with any funder or any investor because they are looking for you to really know your project, they are looking for you to understand the dynamics, and you have to have a way of expressing that. They don't want to see that you have a lot of gaps in your knowledge, okay? They want to see that you understand and that you can execute on this project, okay? So we'll get into those content and contextual factors later that make up the internal project info uh, memo. Now, basically, after that, that's just internal. Um, at other points in time, or even, you know, after you finish it, you may do a summary, you know, a higher level document that expresses, uh, you know, that short, basically, that says, you know, what 
you know, it's an output of the project info memorandum. It's more like an executive summary, okay? Um, but the internal project info memorandum, how we use it is as a team because it helps keep us on track with the different variables. So this can actually be quite a long document. It does not have to be written like a report. It can be, the information can be kept in a working document format in bullets. Then another thing that strengthens your, uh, you know, your, your position is having letters of intent and MOUs. That could be with the government, it could be um, with an EPC, although again, these things are difficult because they typically want to see that you have the means uh, to get the feasibility done and to get the thing financed, okay? Uh, also, oftentimes, uh, like in our area, because we work with partnering funding and investors, they will give us letters of intent that are generic that say we will uh, definitely look at this project once it's presented and it, you know, these things have to, um, you know, be in place for us to fund, but um, basically we're willing to look at it. So that's good because uh, when you present those types of things, it at least shows that you've done some background work and that you've talked to people, okay? So, so note, it's, it's good, it doesn't guarantee anything, okay? But again, you are starting to shape and structure, you're starting, starting to bring those pieces together. And then of course, a pre-feasibility study, what is that? T typically a pre-feasibility is going to be uh, a scaled, limited study to show that the project is potentially feasible. Um, if it's energy, it might be looking at the feedstock to see if there's enough feedstock if it was a biomass project. Um, and so it's not, again, a full feasibility. So still yet, oftentimes, you can get some funding for that. Um, but again, it's very limited. So you have to, again, look at partners and people and groups that you can work with who are willing to uh, partner with you with the, uh, with the opportunity of getting the uh, benefit of, you know, either ownership or the larger contract. And that is possible. But again, it's negotiation, it's developing relationships, it's not an overnight thing. Okay, so you really have to be on top of everything. And then, of course, you're going to plan your feasibility. And uh, you're going to do the feasibility study, uh, but that includes uh, economic impact assessment. You know, how is this going to help the economy around that community, around that site? Uh, the env environmental impact, what, you know, impact is that? Does, occurs when you put up that site, uh, when you build on that site. And then stage two, stage three, stakeholder engagement is where you are now engaging with the community, all of the key stakeholders uh, quite fully, okay? And it's not only to understand the social impact, it's also to develop that stakeholder ecosystem to ensure that you have strength in your stakeholder ecosystem to carry this project forward. If the government is not committed, if the community is not committed, if other key stakeholders are not committed, you will have problems with your project, even if it's technically, socially, you know, uh, you know, economically feasible. Okay, so this is, uh, this is again more of the heavy work of, you know, really getting that stakeholder ecosystem to work for you. Because again, trust um, is, is a, uh, asset that can be um, exchanged, you know, it, not exchanged in the sense you give it away or take it away um, or receive it, um, you know, like a commodity, but it allows you, as a result of trust, is probably the better way of saying it, it allows you to exchange things because people trust that, um, you know, you, they, they trust certain things about you. Okay, so, um, then again, you're going to have to do a go, no-go decision. And then in the concept finalization, or as we call it, concept uh, refinement and finalization, that's where you now have basically a bankable project. You're deciding whether that bankable project, you know, is uh, worth moving forward on because not every bankable project you may decide probably after the investment you're not going to do that. But there could be uh, circumstances in the environment um, new regulations, new technology, things that have changed that um, change the whole dynamic of your project. So even though it was bankable when, you know, you did the study, all of a sudden something different could happen. Uh, another thing, you know, like in 2008, funding for projects dried up. 
And so people had bankable projects, but it was hard to get the funding or the investment. And so again, you know, something can happen that says we, we're not going to move forward with it. And even on one hand, even if someone says that it's not a bankable project, um, and then they make recommendations for how you can improve it, improve it and make it work, well, it might be then something that you would go forward with, even though at this stage it's not bankable, okay? Um, so in the concept finalization, you then have obviously ongoing stakeholder engagement. Uh, you're going to now be working with your um, engineering firm, the design firm. You're going to be working with your EPC. Um, and so you're going to get out of that engineering designs, construction design and plans, and your operator, operation and maintenance plans. And you will now be looking at people who can help you package this, it's feasible, but now you have to get this whole thing packaged. The business plan, the financial model, the investor presentation, all of this has to be packaged in a way that works for the investor, potential investors and potential funders and potential partners, not for you, okay? So typically you're bringing in, um, you know, consultants to help you do this, or it could be a part of your internal team as well. And let me say that again, uh, this is also a stage where you're now going to really need uh, attorneys because you are now going to also be doing uh, agreements. Um, you know, your power purchase agreement, your EPC agreement, your operator agreement. And so, uh, you know, attorneys, accountants, people who do the financial modeling, uh, then even transaction advisors, who are the people often who will structure, help you get your um, project funded for percentage of the finance and other fees they do also charge, um, you know, of the financial transaction. And so um, you, um, you know, are again are bringing in a lot more people in order to present the project to the funders or investors. Even after you found that it's bankable, that isn't enough necessarily to fully convince investors and funders. There are many other things that they want you to uh, want to see happen, and that's where you get again those transaction advisors, um, you know, the financial modeler, the um, attorney, accountant, you know, all of those people involved in order to do this. And also, then as a part of that, um, you form the SPV the special purpose vehicle that is designated for the project. And of course you work on getting the site itself, the permitting and licensing uh, finalized as well. And then, you know, once all of that is packaged, uh, then now you can look at financial close. And let me also say that throughout all these steps, you should have been contacting funders and investors at some point. Uh, not so much in the concept development, although you should have been investigating in the background, you know, where you can go to get funding or investors throughout the life cycle of this project development, okay? So again, with baselines, you're going to investigate a lot of the background. You're not going to necessarily activate it, but you want to have an idea of, okay, when I get to my pre-feasibility, who am I going to go to? When I go to look for feasibility money, who am I going to go to? You know, when now it's bankable, who's going to help us finance that period between, um, you know, the feasibility and the financial close? And so often, for example, that will be investors, you know, because you have something bankable and they can see that you've made progress and whatever else. So money then and resources, more resources begin to come forward because of the bankability of that project. Okay. So, um, then, you know, obviously after financial close, other things can still happen, you know, and so there'll still be a decision by your team, by your investors, whether this project is a go or a no-go, and then you go into construction. So that's basically showing us the process view of this. And again, looking at the circles, remember that everything is still kind of iterative, okay? Now, feasibility isn't necessarily, because obviously you're typically hiring someone to do that, you're, you know, and you're getting people to do the social impact assessment, but it's still, those may be kind of what I call linear in one sense, but your activities 
you know, often are going to be somewhat iterative around that because you're still working to uh, flesh out the, the project and things that may not be a, a part of the feasibility study, maybe dealing, for example, with your stakeholders overall, that's something that you keep working on, you know, to improve upon until you can get, you know, that project completely uh, developed enough and structured enough so that you can get the funding and the investment and move the project into construction. Okay, so that again is the, the process view. Now we're going to take a look at the content and contextual factors view. And um, in this case, we have basically seven what we call uh, categories. And then in total, we have 21 dimensions that you actually look at when we're talking about um, the content and context of your uh, project. First, we have broad impact. and um, these really talk about um, issues and variables that basically kind of uh, permeate all of the project life cycle and, um, you know, just uh, are embedded into many different areas of the project, okay? And so the first of that is context, and this refers to the environment in which the project is being developed and will operate and covers a multitude of factors that may directly or indirectly impact the project. Um, and again, traditional methodologies uh, may actually refer to this as an environmental analysis. However, the I idea of context is more broad and then goes beyond an environmental analysis. So, uh, for example, we talk about uh, geographical regional dimensions. You know, um, what impact does uh, the local, national, and international, for example, have on the project? They're different variables. So, basically, we're we're asking you to look at um, you know, ensuring that you're looking at your context, you know, at more than one dimension. So when we talk about context, it is an environmental analysis. It's broader. It has more elements. Um, it's not, the, the purpose of it really isn't any different than an environmental analysis, but we use the word contextual analysis instead because we have uh, many more factors that are looked at. Then um, we also have concerns and conflicts, and that's really focused around the risks um, and issues that are associated with the project. And these risks can be both positive and negative. And um, there can be, uh, you know, issues that you deal with that just pop up. You know, for example, a new government administration. That becomes an issue because you're not really sure if that's going to impact whether or not your project can move forward as, as you've planned it or you structured it. You know, is that going to change the dynamics of your agreement with the government? Um, are they going to introduce new policies that will not make it favorable for your project? And so uh, this is an ongoing thing, and obviously these things touch every area. And uh, the goal is, of course, is to begin to gain an understanding of these risks and these issues early on in order to identify, assess, mitigate, and follow up on them. Okay, and in the case of risks, that's a whole systematic process that we'll talk about, um, but definitely that's an area that you want to look at. And then we talk about uh, consequences and sustainability. Uh, this is where we look at the social, environmental, and economic impact that the project will have on its surrounding at various stages of the project development life cycle. And we also talk a lot about stewardship um, because uh, when you are doing a major project, it does impact resources. It impacts, um, you know, land resources. It impacts um, government resources. It impacts uh, communities. And so um, the, you know, we call it oftentimes, you know, uh, environmental awareness or, you know, um, uh, and we don't really think of the word stewardship. Stewardship means that resources have been given into your hand and you are to manage them well. That's, that's a simple definition. And then um, when you're considering results, outcomes, and impacts of a project, um, basically, you know, in this particular model that we do have here, we really focus on not only those things that are tangible, but also soft or intangible. Um, so that means that you're dealing not only with the hard facts about a project and what it takes to do it, but you're dealing, for example, with the stakeholder ecosystem that has feelings, needs, you know, 
uh, motivations and that is a soft side that you have to be able to manage as well and under, understand. So then on the, the micro market, um, that's really when we talked about the broader impact that really looks at the, um, you know, we looked at the context which is the macro environment. With the micro environment, there are different elements that, um, you know, are closer to the project and that is uh, customers and markets. Um, collaborators and partners and channels and chains. Chains. So customers and markets really are those who receive the benefit from or or um, uh, who drive the revenue streams of the project. Okay. So you know again, if it's um, the toll roads, it would be the users of the toll road, for an example. And uh, in this, you want a good understanding of who the customer is. And uh, in order to gain a better understanding how, of how to best deliver those services. And then with collaborators and partners, um, the idea is to um, look at those who um, excuse me, collaborators, competitors, basically, you want to find um, collaborators that um, basically uh, could be your competitors. You might, our, our thing is we're very focused on stakeholder ecosystems, so we don't necessarily see others as competitors, we see them as potential collaborators. So that's, there's this whole different dimension of change, we call it co-opetition, where those who are even in direct competition with each other actually partner, and you'll see that a lot in the tech industry. Um, and so, um, so the idea is is to basically look at a competitor and industry analysis to you know really pull out and understand uh, who are potential collaborators and who are competitors and keep track of that and then ultimately determining through that who end up being your uh, eventual partners. And then uh, channels and chains refers to how inputs flow into the production and into the customer. Um, so for example. Uh, whatever the value chain is for, um, you know, for an energy plant, okay, so those inputs, for example, would be the chains, you have inputs, you have uh, the source of energy, if it's biomass, then that's some type of feedstock, how do you get it there, how is it prepped, those are the, the inputs, and then after that, once you've produced whatever that product is, then channels refers to the distribution. How does it actually get to the to the customer? And in that, we are looking at who are the key actors and the inputs and outputs for every stage uh, in both uh, the value chain or in a more limited fashion, just the distribution channel, so that uh, you begin to again understand the different dynamics that are at play around your project. Uh, then we talk about levers, and levers basically are those things that as the project is increasing in value, value, there are things that you can leverage to make your project more attractive or leverage what you are putting together for uh, further benefit for your stakeholders. So one is creation, so basically there you're looking at every aspect throughout the entire project of where you're creating unique value. So, for example, when you go through your first couple projects and they are successful, you have developed a value chain or an ecosystem of people that you can uh, move forward with to do even more. Okay, so you've created that foundation, so that's just one example. And so the idea is, is that you want to, in the idea of creating value, you want to create a reciprocal system of value exchange, that, that stakeholder ecosystem. This is not just about creating value for the customer, but it's about creating uh, a, um, a uh, reciprocal value exchange for all of your key stakeholders. So they will give something into the project and they will also then benefit from the project. Okay. Common good is really talking about the broad-based benefits um, both to internal and external stakeholders. So in this, they're what they call um, globally beneficial organizations, and there are some standards and practices that you can employ and that we discuss in detail, but it could be things like, you know, employees, are you providing health insurance, time off, um, you know, are they, uh, you know, are they, um, are members of your board also, you know, from the community, for example, uh, or from, 
other key stakeholder groups, not just, you know, people that you've picked out that are part of your inner group. Um, and so the idea is, is that this helps you be intentional about creating a system of common good. And, um, and so uh, it's really a long-term thing, but you, and you are not necessarily going to implement a full plan during project development, but you can put in the seeds of that. First of all, the design of that, the strategy, but also their elements, particularly dealing with stakeholders or people like, you know, employees, how you treat them, how you structure things um, to help them, you know, participate on the project um, can, is a part of this, this idea of common good. And then Compound looks at, again, how you can now leverage all of these things, like, for example, what you've created, uh, common good, those two areas. Now, how can you leverage that founda those foundations that you've built? You know, what can you do? So, for example, you've built a great stakeholder ecosystem and, you know, and your relationships within those key stakeholder groups are very good. How can you take that and put it into another project opportunity or into an entirely different venture, possibly? You know, that is what we talk compound. You're multiplying, um, you know, uh, what you are getting out of the project because you're leveraging what's already there, okay, what's already been established. And then um, we also have uh, stakeholders and um, that really is, um, again, uh, we, we brought in that as a as a category, but the, the three key dimensions is community and stakeholders. And really, this is where you're really looking at all of your key stakeholders and doing that stakeholder potential partner analysis. And, you know, keeping track of that and updating that and, you know, um, leveraging your knowledge and understanding and those relationships to benefit the project. And then circles of influence, that's taking your group of stakeholders and saying, okay, what circles of influence do we gain through these stakeholders? Not in a, um, um, how can I put it, in a uh, mechanistic way, but being realistic and saying, you know, there is some benefit to having certain stakeholders on board. Okay, and so the idea is to identify that because there are times on your projects where you need to leverage that. You know. Um, I know that we have gotten as far as we've gotten because we've had specific people who were in specific positions who really believed in what we did, okay? And if it hadn't been for them, we wouldn't have gotten to the next level. And so those are, you know, understanding those dynamics and understanding where their influence is and, you know, what they have, for example, influence or control over can be very, very strategic for your project. Um, again, there are just hundreds of variables that you end up considering on your project. And so many ways to get over those obstacles is to have the right people on your side, okay? And so um, that's why this whole stakeholder category is very important. And then, of course, communication and feedback is basically taking a systematically deeper look into how you are um you know, on that project and how you're uh, getting feedback and providing feedback. And basically communication is very important because it promotes transparency and trust. And obviously that's important in a stakeholder ecosystem. And, you know, the idea that you can just look at the technical aspects of a project without considering the stakeholders is basically that is an old thought. It should have never been there. I don't know, you know, again, if we look at history, people think of just transactions, but honestly, trust and transparency go a long way in helping you get over those challenges. Um, if you cannot, if you don't have transparency or particularly trust, um, and a good example right now is what's going on with Greece. You know, they're deeply in debt and they need the help of other nations, but their actions in the last six months really probably the last uh, five years have just made it that, you know, others don't trust them. And so they just don't, you know, want to just give them, you know, another opportunity to do something when they don't trust them. And so now it even makes the difficulty of, you know, working through 
their economic situation a lot more difficult. So, you know, that's what your project can look like, you know, if you don't have trust uh, in your stakeholder ecosystem. So it's very important that um, uh, trust be established and maintained and fostered. Um, and it's a, it's a gift or something that you have that you shouldn't just, um, you know, kind of, you know, consider it of really no value because it's trust that really makes a difference in oftentimes in the context of Africa, okay? And trust can be gained in different ways. One, by using this process and moving forward and showing that you're, you know, getting stuff done and, you know, and you know what you're doing, that uh, elicits trust because it's trust through uh, competency, but there's trust sometimes just because you're in the same group, sometimes because people know you in a social situation. So there's many ways or types of trust, but the key is, is that you need to maintain that trust in order to be able to access many things that you're going to need in project development. Um, you know, it's not the money that's really the problem. It's these elements of stakeholders, of, of you know, understanding how to get people on board with you you know, on your project when it isn't bankable as of yet. And so this is, um, you know, again, a very important area. And then we have um, company, which uh, talks about three areas of company ownership and structure. And that's really, really talking about the special purpose vehicle, uh, the project structure, and the project finance structure and project ownership. And this has a lot to do with, of course, your legal experts. Um, but again, we try to provide, obviously, a framework so that you can assess, you know, initially and understand and, you know, watch for things as you're developing your project. And the capacity is referring to the technical and organizational capacity. So um, that could be knowledge, skills, experience, uh, the ability, uh, the know-how to get things done. And this can also be uh, looking at the local, um, you know, capacity. Are there engineers? Are there uh, workers that you can hire, you know, for your project? Because often uh, local content or, you know, uh, offering opportunities to indigenous people becomes a very, you know, big factor in getting agreements with governments. And then credibility. Um, you'll see that we separate, you know, out several different things because uh, oftentimes things like credibility or stakeholders kind of gets, you know, put down, you know, below everything else. And so in our model, we're trying to give, you know, uh, equitable weight to the, those things that are tangible, intangible, um, and that are more, you know, hard versus the soft side and people side is always a soft side okay so credibility often is also a soft side thing so you know credibility is considering your reputation um, and uh, basically uh, its reputation is often built by the expertise and experience that you demonstrate and the things that you do so that credibility then also then leads to trust to building trust and that trust is built because you are demonstrating that you're a good steward over the many elements affected by the project and then solution um, the three areas are complex configuration and construction operation and maintenance and complex is really dealing with the project site and it ends up being the anchor of all of the other elements if you remember a little bit earlier I indicated that um, you needed to have a physical location, a site, for most to consider that you actually have a project, okay? Um, without a site, there is no project. Uh, people will not fund, they will not, you know, invest. You need to have a site. Configuration is really the, uh, the mix of the inputs, supplies, the processes, the activities that are involved in the technical solution. And then construction, operation, and maintenance um, are all tightly tied together, um, you know, in terms of getting finance. So you need to have your construction plan figured out, your operation, and your maintenance. And all of these uh, plans and agreements must be very detailed and meticulously overseen. Uh, this obviously involves the EPC and your operator and possibly a design firm. Um, but basically, um, this really comes down to when we look at this, this is coming down to the agreements, you know, that you have with an EBC, 
with an operator and then potentially a design firm. And so all of these are then inputs that you are finalizing and putting together as you are working on getting your funding and your finance. Then um, from solution then we have capital. And I actually put this as a last area because really you have to have you know all of those different pieces working together. They all work, all, all seven categories, all 21 dimensions, all make up the comprehension, the full business model of what you're doing. But the, the key thing is to note that um, you know, many of these other elements have to be developed well enough through the stages uh, in order to make any advancement on capital. Okay, so there's basically three areas under here, uh, capital, finance, and economics, cash and cost, and commitments. Okay, so actually I'm going to start with commitments. Commitments are really all the informal and formal agreements that are made between stakeholders and need to be managed. Um, those will be, um, for example, if it's related to the company structure, that would be, you know, the owners, um, the directors, the investors. Um, so you will have things like partnership agreements, you will have shareholder agreements, so on and so forth. Commitments would also refer to the EPC um, contract, the power purchase agreement, uh, for example, or you know agreement with government, concession agreement. Um, it would also refer to um, your uh, agreement with, um, excuse me, lost my thought there, but basically you're looking at all the major agreements that need to be in place uh, when we're talking about that. And so there are a lot of different elements. Obviously your legal team is going to be on this, but we do provide a framework for you to understand what's going on and what needs to be negotiated. Um, because oftentimes you, when you start talking with government, you may not actually have a lawyer um, you know, with you early on. So you want to understand what that contract or agreement might look like and what you need to discuss. Not that you decide upon it without legal counsel, but, um, but again, the more you know and understand, the better you go into this um, and being able to work with others in order to get the project developed or, uh, and or structured. And so that's the first thing. Then, of course, uh, cash and cost. That's really revenue and cost. Um, and that refers to the revenue streams and the financial projections. Without this, you can't get the project finance. So that, again, uh, is going to, in part, come out of the um, feasibility to a certain extent and then uh, the fi ultimately the, the financial model. And to some degree, um, so there will be some, probably some financial modeling, obviously, with the feasibility, but basically um, the financial modeler is looking at different scenarios of funding and structuring. So that's what we mean uh, more so when we're talking about um, financial modeling. Cash and cost is really just the basic uh, economics of the project. Okay, so um, because, remember, with projects, um, the revenue stream is the guarantee of the funders or investors getting something out of this. For the funders, they would get their money back, you know, with interest or whatever else, other, other fees. And then for investors, that they would get their return on investment. Okay, so, um, so the idea behind projects that have project finance is oftentimes that you actually do not have the collateral to pay for the project yourself. You know, you can't give funding, so um, you need to basically get someone to fund you um, and take that risk. And how they do that is they collateralize the assets on the project. One and first and foremost is the revenue stream. There has to be sufficient revenue stream over that period of time. And then secondly, they also securitize all of the assets. So that often means that once that's done, there's very little you can do even though you own the company because the funders um, basically are locking down everything to ensure that they get what they're supposed to get out of the project, okay?
So that's um, so then the last one is capital finance and economics, and that's really talking about um, the different types of, you know, we go into the different variables that you need to look at uh, related to debt finance and equity and, um, you know, and looking at uh, the different aspects of how you can then draw your capital, the types of capital that are available, the different institutions that you can go to, um, and again, in order to help you flush out um, you know, the, the project, flesh it out, and then be able to uh, work an action plan based on what you know. So, how again, let's go back and say, how does this then connect with um, the process? This is the content and the contextual factors. How does this then, you know, connect with the, um, you know, with the process? So, you really start looking, you can start looking at all of these elements really from the get-go, you know, in your concept development. Basically, as soon as you start doing your contextual analysis, you're beginning the process of beginning to review these different variables in detail, okay? The thing, though, is that and you'll gain, again, as you're going through the, the different baselines, you're going to gain information relevant to these different areas. But it's not until the proof of concept where you begin to, and you develop the internal project information memorandum, that you will actually have uh, sufficient detail to understand these different factors. Okay? And so from that point, right, you have all of this knowledge now about what's going on in the different dynamics. Now you can seriously begin to look at how you develop or shape that project. Structuring is more talking about the financial structuring, the structuring that's needed in order to make it work financially. But here we're really talking about the economic, you know, the, the social, the, the technical, all of that stuff, uh, all of that information that, you're, that you have now helps you see where you are and where you need to go. And so uh, then from the time that you've investigated these thoroughly, again, in the internal project information memorandum, that really is a part of the pre-feasibility, by the way. Okay, you're really doing that all at once. Um, then you can make a um, what I would call a um, plan of action on how to address and close any gaps that you see. Obviously, uh, a lot of that will be flushed out in a feasibility study, but remember again, we've talked about uh, informal, formal, tangible, intangible, hard versus soft factors, and so there are many things that are still at play that don't get covered by the feasibility study. So again, that's what we're trying to ensure is that you have a means of, you know, looking at all of these things, whether it's informal, formal, tangible, hard or soft, um, in one place, okay, and making sure that they're being addressed as you're working through. And so, um, you know, when we look at these, you know, different dimensions now, we'll see that, um, you know, the whole thing really comes together really quite well uh, in terms of the, the way that the project works together. And what I would like to say is that, you know, when you're looking at this, again, there's a lot of different pieces, but the interesting thing is once you investigate uh, the different areas in sufficient detail, you will begin to see patterns emerge. That's the purpose of um, understanding these different elements. It's not just to have uh, minutia or detail, but it's to, you know, get you to a point where you're able to see how things should be fitting together and they're not fitting together. Or, you know, seeing things that, you know, unless you understand your context, unless you understand uh, several different variables, you will not be able, you know, to, of course, you know, look at this and investigate it in the right way. And so for many of us, you know, when we're looking through this, it becomes an interesting uh, play in terms of, um, you know, looking at uh, how these things work. Um, and so what we've looked at is we've looked at uh, the idea of having uh, having uh, three different views as it relates to these projects. Now, process, when you look at process here, you know, I think people understand that very well. You know, you get from an idea, you go to construction, and 
there are things that you have to do in order to get to that. And so that's obviously, you know, a pretty easy thing to look at. Um, the content and the context. I also think, you know, really, I think, you know, ultimately uh, that again, you know, makes sense to most people and it's, uh, you know, not a problem. So when we look at this, um, we've basically, you know, seen that um, the we see that we get different things when we look at different views. When we look at a process view, we see the pieces and when they need to happen and, and activities, right? We see steps. When we uh, see the content, content and the context, we actually then begin to see um, everything that fills in those steps and those activities. You know, what does it mean um, to have a stakeholder ecosystem to do a stakeholder analysis. You know, what is that? What are the parts of that? What are the variables? Uh, you know, who is at play? And, you know, how do we work that? And so those two, again, I think ultimately make sense. And, you know, even though people don't necessarily know all of the content and the contextual factors just automatically, um, it, it makes sense. Okay, um, I think the part that is missed quite a bit uh, when we talk about um, Africa or developing regions and really anywhere because this is actually, you know, no matter how much we talk about this being Africa and the things that you need to do and this is how you make it work, in reality the world is relational and so um, having the ability to um, you know, work with many different people and pull them together around an ecosystem, stakeholder ecosystem, is really, really quite important. So that's the third piece that we're going to take a look at. And um, again, um, just give me a moment because I need to switch slides, but understand that um, you need all three views. And there, you know, people may even come up with other views of how to look at a project. Uh, you know, we work on the, you know, we think that three is enough. Uh, because in doing so, you begin to see gaps because you're looking at things from different perspectives. Um, as an example, let's say, um, let's say you have um, a person who's a financer. Okay, this is just to give you an example of different perspectives, different views, right? When a financer looks at a project, they're looking at the risk and what they'll get out of it, right? Okay, is the, uh, is the money that we'll get, will we get our money back and will we make money off of this transaction, right? Um, a government will say, okay, will we be able to have energy, um, you know, to enough energy to help our industrial sector be more productive? Okay, so these are different views and different reasons, different motivations, and they're both equally important or very important in that process, but they give you a different perspective on that same project, okay? So when we look, when we talk about the views of um, process and then content and context and then stakeholder ecosystems, all of them are important, but they all are really linked together and integrated and they work together. But you need to have an understanding and be able to work with all three different frames of reference. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at what I mean about the stakeholder ecosystem. And to start, I just wanted to, to give you um, just the traditional view of what a project looks like, okay, when it's structured, okay? So you have your project company, the SPV, and then you have all of these uh, groups of people coming around to get that project moving, okay? You have your lenders, your suppliers, your investors, your users. Uh, your EPC equipment vendors and construction engineers. Okay, so this is a very traditional view of, um, you know, a project. Okay, the project company, the SBV, is that which operates the project. Okay, if it's energy, if it's a road, that is the uh, project, that is the company that owns the project and then operates it. Or, well, yes, over it owns it and it delegates, for example, construction and 
then uh, operation. Okay, so um, now let's look at it differently. This is an ecosystem view. We still have the EPC, uh, the funders and the investors. We still have the suppliers, but we also now are looking at having the communities, having capacity building institutions, um, having, uh, if it's energy, of course, the utility, having government. Okay, so we actually are now seeing a, a totally, totally different picture, and it's based on the those key stakeholders that would, you know, would be involved. And the reason why we're looking at this is that every single one of these will receive benefit from you doing that project, which means then hopefully negotiate contributions from them to the project at different stages. And so the idea is that uh, you are leveraging their resources. Every single one of these have resources that potentially could help your project get over the hump. Uh, for example, development agencies, capacity building institutions, they might be able to do some things for you in the early stages, help you with pre-feasibility. If they don't give you money, maybe they can, you know, provide you the technical assistance to get it done. Um, you know, again, there are many different ways that you have to configure your project. And the idea is you need to first understand the stakeholders, who they are and what they can bring to the table and what you can benefit. And then as you're developing relationships, you'll find that you'll find solutions for what you need to have done. So as an example, um, with one group that we're working with, it's not uh, an energy project, but it's an agricultural project, and they were looking for basically funding, you know, or people to invest. And really, their project was really pretty much a concept, okay? But they had some very strong partnerships that they were able to get on board. Okay, one of the regional, uh, one of the regional um, economic blocks in Africa. So they had a lot of endorsement. They had a lot of strength. Then they had another group that was an industry associate in a country that needed what they would provide. That group actually brought the money to do the pre-feasibility and the pilot, pilot. So again, they use those partnerships and those relationships to bring in because of um, the benefit that they were giving to a group that might not be normally, you know, you wouldn't go to think to go to to get feasibility money, right, or pilot money. But because it was beneficial to that organization, they set up the money to get it done. Okay, so that's why it's important to really look at your ecosystem view and find those groups who really would derive a great benefit from what you're doing and see what you can leverage to move your project forward. And again, this now is changing the dynamics. It's not a transactional view. It's actually a reciprocal system of value exchange. You see the arrows as it goes into the project company, but it goes out. So everybody, every key stakeholder group uh, receives benefit, but also should be contributing benefit. And so this is what, this is your nucleus of how you're going to make your project work. It's not the process. It's not the content and the context. This is the nucleus of how you get your project done. because through stakeholders, you will find the resources, the partners, and the funding that you need. And so this is a uh, area that people wait until the very end or don't even necessarily do because they're just looking for money. They don't understand where to look for money. They don't understand where to look for to get what they need in order to move further. When you begin to develop your stakeholder ecosystem and that becomes your um, you know, that becomes the, the engine for getting your project done, then that's when you begin to see where the resources and, you know, the funding and all that comes from. And it does take time. This is not an overnight thing, but you'll find that most projects, you know, when we're talking about those long-term projects, easily they take 18 months, two years to, you know, get to construction, okay? So they can be, you know, accelerated. So you have time. So this is now when we talk about that, you know, stage one, 
uh, stakeholder engagement, the ideas that you're going to identify these different key stakeholders, you're going to understand about them, and then at appropriate times as you're doing your project development, you, be, you will begin to interface with them. And in that exchange, in that relationship building, you will begin to see your resources, partners, and your funders and investors. They will start coming to you, okay? I mean, not literally, but you know, where you can get access to different things. And so oftentimes, the strength of getting a project done, um, you know, when there are other challenges, even with the process, even with the content and the context, is your ecosystem. There are things that people will make, if they are on your side, they will make decisions to help you. They will take the risk because they trust you, okay? And so the ecosystem, this is the, the one thing that needs to be preserved. This is the one thing that needs to be maintained and grown because from it, you will be able to do an infinite number of things. Um, that is not the case if a project goes, but you totally, your ecosystem, for whatever reason, they don't trust you, they don't like you, you know, it's going to make it harder for you to do the next project. And so the idea is to spend, um, you know, time and dedicate time to building this ecosystem. So this should just, again, give you an overview of, you know, how our methodology works with those three different areas. Again, I'm not uh, trying to give you every bit of detail um, concerning this because obviously you can see that there's a lot of detail, but this will definitely give you, you know, a good uh, look at, um, you know, how uh, you pull all of these pieces together, okay? And so this is, again, just an overview to give you an idea um, of what we're about with our project development methodology, the VentureLogic um, PDM. And um, we definitely look forward to seeing you in our programs, in our project development uh, workshops and incubation. And uh, what we would be doing is essentially showing you what we do with this methodology in order to, you know, uh, develop projects. And then, of course, as a part of that, you know, we provide support. We, you know, connect you with funders and investors for your time. Um, so the workshop comes so that you can uh, begin to move in this path uh, so that you have sufficient knowledge and understanding and you begin can begin to work on your project. And then the incubation period is where you then get the coaching and uh, the, the full access to the ecosystem in order to then begin to bring those resources and partners to the table, you know, including funders and investors. Um, so we look forward again. Um, I hope this has been helpful, at least to give you some background about uh, how we operate. And I don't know if we say why, well, I don't know if I said why we do this, but we're doing this because we truly believe that Africa um, is growing and it needs to be developed in the right way. And there are just not enough projects getting done, not enough ventures getting where they need to get. And so, um, you know, one area that we saw that there was a huge gap was just in project development and venture development, having a rigorous, comprehensive process that would uh, yield results, um, yield better results uh, in terms of moving from one stage to another in maturing your venture or your project. Um, so again, if you need uh, any additional help, obviously go to our websites, uh, the foundation at www.afrobiz.org. And, um, and uh, from there, you can contact us by email or by phone. And uh, looking again forward to seeing you in our project development programs.